why strength and conditioning matters more than you think. As a Muay Thai fighter, your primary training focus will always be your Muay Thai training. Hours of skilled, purposeful practice is essential for both gaining technical skill and tactical advantage, and for efficient, skilled movement. It will do you no good to remain focused on getting stronger if you lack the proficiency to use your current strength correctly. However, it's a big mistake to believe you can continue to develop the required cardiovascular fitness, strength and speed, etc. by simply practicing Muay Thai. Practicing Thai boxing technique alone will leave your power production potential woefully underdeveloped, and you'll eventually hit a plateau in speed as well. You can't get appreciably faster without an increase in power and strength. After an initial period of adaptation, you'll have to start being more deliberate about your training to continue your growth in the sport. Strength and conditioning, done properly, brings things to the party that Thai boxing alone can't. It balances postural habits and strength imbalances to reduce injury. It allows you to focus on moving correctly and to test this rather than encouraging rapid but poor movement under fatigue. It builds your maximum strength and power potential so that you can overcome your opponent physically. It systematically builds your energy supply and usage to relentlessly apply your power in a fight. And it makes sure you peak properly for a fight and are getting better month on month, year after year, rather than going around in circles. Strength and conditioning is improving the performance of your vehicle, like taking a racing car into the workshop and increasing the size and power of the engine improving the fuel economy, fuel tank capacity, upgrading the brakes, suspension, and tires, etc. This improves the vehicle's performance, but it also makes it more robust and less likely to break down. Skill training is improving the skill of the driver so that he, she, can operate the vehicle at a higher level of skill and mastery. In Muay Thai, your body is your vehicle, and you, the consciousness operator of the body, are the driver. So both aspects are important. Both are critical to winning or losing. Arguing that one is superior to the other is naive. The most skilled driver will lose in a crappy vehicle when competing against similarly skilled drivers in high-performance vehicles. For example, if you take Samart Payakarun, who many consider to be the greatest of all time, at his current age and pit him against a young, hungry stadium fighter, you can bet no matter how skilled and intelligent he is, he won't win that fight using a vehicle, body, that isn't fit to compete and a high-performance vehicle won't win if the driver isn't skilled enough to use it to its fullest potential. You've got to have both sides of the equation, a high-performance body and mind. And it's in your best interest to start training both as early as possible, if you care about growing as much as possible in this sport. 1. S&C is a high-reward long-term investment, not a quick fix. Your body can only develop as a result of planned, progressive, systematic overload over a period of time. Unlike tuning up a car, you can't build physical capability overnight with some last-minute overtime by the team of mechanics. It takes time for your body to adapt to training, and it takes planned, progressive overload to maintain this progress and to build on it. You need to understand that it's an investment, one that will heap a whole load of reward that those that don't follow through will never see. So if you're truly committed to your own personal growth and performing at your highest potential, regardless of whether you choose to compete or not, I highly recommend making this investment as early as possible, as it will have a significant compounding effect over the years and will accelerate your growth in the sport unlike anything else, as long as you keep up your skill training. 2. SNC accelerates skill development. Just like Muay Thai technique, movements used in the weights room are skilled movement patterns that transfer to athletic performance, if done correctly. The gym is an opportunity to practice these patterns, honing the coordinated actions of multiple muscle groups to transfer force from the ground while maintaining stability through a challenging range of motion. This is nothing new, but it's surprising how many people completely waste this opportunity with poor exercise choices or using poor movement mechanics. Remember that every repetition you complete further hardwired your autonomous coordinated movement patterns. Your forming habits, make them good ones. Execute mechanically efficient, stable movement patterns that you can call on automatically later when under extreme stress and fatigue. Teach your body in the weights room to coordinate multi-joint, multi-planar muscle groups together in sequence to efficiently transmit force from the floor. There's no better way to develop this than against resistance. There's feedback telling you when you've got it right or wrong. You can bet that if your knee caves inward during a squat, that's what happens in your fighting stance when you're fatigued. Done properly, weight training exposes movement errors. There's no place to hide. I'm continually humbled by exercises that cause me to crumble and lose form, 
Even though unloaded, I appear to move well. Resistance training sessions allow you to constantly test and screen your mechanical positions to engage in preventative work, rather than waiting for a breakdown, injury, to happen. When you don't move well, that's an injury time bomb waiting to go off, and wasted effort that doesn't transmit into an effect on your opponent in the ring. Movement is about understanding and skillfully mastering the principles and constraints of the human body. Good movement is simply good movement, regardless of the specific application. Although you can debate the application of specific Muay Thai techniques, there's many different ways, styles you can successfully adopt. Good mechanical positions are recognized regardless of sport or discipline, from ballet, gymnastics, rugby, to Muay Thai. The same fundamental principles apply. We all operate under the same constraints. If you're only interested in beasting or lifting heavy stuff with no regard for exercise selection or form and technique, you're not only likely to injure yourself, but you're also wasting a valuable opportunity to move better, to be the best you can be. Respect the contribution that all aspects of your training make to you as a fighter, and practice both SNC and technical Muay Thai from the start. What this means for beginners and fighters. If you're a beginner, your main limitation early on is technical competence, and focusing on this will have the greatest impact on your performance to begin with. New boxers can lack sufficient strength, stability, or mobility to even practice Muay Thai correctly in the first place. This not only prevents correctly patterned skill rehearsal, but also exposes the fighter to an unnecessary injury risk. For individuals that fall into this category, SNC training provides them with the physical qualities required to begin training in Muay Thai and develop solid, fundamental technique. If you're currently competing or have any possibility of doing so in the future, the earlier you start your strength and conditioning training, the better chance you have of competing with a better vehicle than your opponent. And the longer it takes for your opponent to cotton onto this, the further behind they'll be, and the less likely they'll be able to match you physically. There are no shortcuts. Anybody can chuck something together that will make you better for a month or so. But then what? Don't fear the fighter that's trained randomly for a month or so. Fear the fighter that's trained progressively for a year or two and has reaped the rewards. Without proper guidance, most trainees and fighters eventually hit a plateau based on physical limitations and poor striking mechanics. Lack mobility, required for more advanced techniques, especially proper kicks and high kicks gas out quickly, haven't developed biomechanical efficiency in their strikes, causing them to use more energy and leak power. Lack power, haven't properly learned how to generate power from legs and transfer it into striking limbs. They tend to throw arm punches rather than using the power of the entire body, are more prone to injury due to improper movement patterns. When a lot of fighters say they're doing strength and conditioning, they're actually not. But it's all squats and presses. It's like someone saying they're doing Muay Thai when they're doing Kung Fu. But it's all punches and kicks. It's not just what you do, but how you do it that determines the effect. It's important to also understand what we mean by strength and conditioning. They are two different parts of the athletic puzzle. In fact, I rarely advise training both strength and conditioning. I'd prefer to say we train strength or conditioning. Strength training primarily targets the neural adaptations. That's maximum force, your strength, how quickly you can apply that force, your power, and how fast you can move, your speed. And that part of your training is all about producing the strongest spark. And fatigue plays no part in that. Whereas conditioning is the metabolic endurance part, it's how you supply and use energy in the muscles. If you're using circuit training sessions with lower load, higher reps, less rest, and a ton of different exercises, you're not going to build strength. That's a metabolic conditioning session, not a strength session. Conditioning sessions create fatigue, which will dull your spark. If you are supposed to be targeting neural adaptations, you cannot work them in fatigue. It's not a conditioning drill, it's something different. Most fighters don't get stronger because they tend to want to turn all sessions into conditioning sessions, reducing rest periods, adding more exercises, repetitions, and overall volume, which then wastes the opportunity to build something different and vital. Proper SNC does not aim for exhaustion or fatigue just for the sake of it. Rather, it is designed to induce optimal levels of growth and adaptation. Proper SNC is about making your training as efficient and effective as possible, which I will explain here. What is proper SNC? For me, real strength and conditioning for Muay Thai is about three things. Primarily fixing any high-risk injury factors, such as a lack of range of motion, poor stability, bad motor control, or strength imbalances on either side of the joint boosting performance by developing a fighter's potential strength, power, speed, and endurance qualities, or transferring the most performance peaking to the next fight date. There's a lot of confusion when it comes to the terms mobility and flexibility, and it's important to distinguish between the two if you want to kick better as a fighter and to maintain healthy joints that keep you in the game longer. 
Simply put, flexibility is the maximum range of motion, ROM, that you can demonstrate given the most favorable conditions, the most amount of time, and often while assisted, passive. Whereas mobility better describes the active range of motion you have in a joint, that you can control and stabilize yourself as you use it in any given movement task, despite the load you are experiencing or the speed of movement. To illustrate this point, I've seen a lot of passively flexible people in yoga classes that have poor mobility. They are capable of adopting an extreme yoga pose by exploiting their flexibility, but they effectively dump the load into their joints instead of actively holding themselves at their extreme ranges of motion. The muscles are off, stability is only achieved by mechanically sitting on the end stops of the joint itself. A recipe for long-term joint injury, the same range, actively held using the strength and stability of the muscles around the joint, spares the joint from taking the forces, which it's not designed to do. Instead, the muscles take those forces, just like they're designed to do. Fighters should improve flexibility, but train for mobility. Within the turbulent environment of combat sports, dynamic control of high kicks demands active mobility, not just static, passive flexibility. During a video coaching call, one fighter explained to me he had poor kicking mobility, despite demonstrating good hip flexibility, nearly touching the floor while holding a box or side split position, I explained that there's a difference between the static passive flexibility demonstrated in the side splits and either dynamic flexibility, throwing your leg with momentum, or static active flexibility, lifting and holding the leg using the muscles alone. The demands are different, and the range of motion displayed decreases in that order. Static passive flexibility, ROM, an athlete's greatest range. Dynamic flexibility, ROM, an athlete's second greatest range. Static active flexibility, ROM, an athlete's smallest range. Also, this fighter described himself as having big, heavy legs. Because of this, a static split stretch will also much easier for him than dynamically lifting of his legs. In his training, we targeted mobility and stretching of the adductors, groin muscles. But also critically, we equally targeted the strength of hip abductors, such as glute medius, to strengthen the lateral leg lifting action using exercises like sideline clams, band resisted, sideline straight leg lateral raise, ankle weights if needed. Muscles always work in pairs on either side of the joint. This particular fighter was relatively weaker in the muscles that lift his leg out to the side, fighting any tightness in the groin, adductors muscles, and the self-weight of his leg too. Active flexibility is far more important for athletes, correlates more strongly with sporting proficiency, even though passive flexibility provides a protective reserve if a joint unexpectedly stressed beyond its normal operational limits, something that occurs in combat sports like Muay Thai. If your kicking mobility is a limiting factor for you too, don't just think about stretching. Combining stretching and strengthening exercises increases the correlation between active and passive flexibility and decrease the difference between them. Overall, there are three elements of mobility. One, muscle length due to trigger points, those knots in your muscles that build up because you're training hard, and getting kicked in the thighs. Two, range of motion due to the joint capsule itself, how the bones are positioned relative to each other. Three, neuromuscular control, what your brain tells your body is usable range of motion. I advocate a three-step exercise process to tackle all three of these elements and fast track your active mobility as a fighter. Each exercise addresses each of the three elements of mobility. One, release exercise, soft tissue work to increase muscle length. Two, open exercise. Joint distraction work to feed the extra range from the increased muscle length in the first exercise into the joint capsule. Three, anchor exercise. To teach the neuromuscular system that you have a new range of motion available so that you can actively use it. Here, the three exercises used are release, quad hip flexor, tack and stretch open, quad and hip flexor band, distraction, anchor, rear foot elevated split squat. These mobility exercises can be used before a training session as part of your warm-up, helping you to move correctly and anchor great movement habits in the rest of your session. The anchoring of neuromuscular control is a big player in giving you mobility that your body can really use and is a step usually missed by athletes looking to improve their mobility flexibility. Creating the best movement possible is fundamental to both injury reduction and performance enhancement. It's well worth your time and effort the release and open exercises are also useful as active recovery between weight training sets that then use that range to anchor it and make it more permanent. Alternatively, you can use nothing but these exercises to make a recovery session by combining release open anchor exercises for various different parts of your body, hamstrings, adductors, shoulders, thoracic spine, etc. Although, don't do all this stuff just for the sake of it, only if it's necessary. Strength, power, and speed are three different, although dependent, physical qualities that must be individually targeted to reach your full athletic potential as a fighter. 
Supplemental strength and conditioning training is the only way a Thai boxer can hope to exploit this potential. Strength training develops the maximum amount of force you can produce. Strength training requires heavy, slow, compound lifts like deadlifts, squats, bench presses, shoulder presses, rows, pull-ups. We use primarily bilateral lifts, exercises that use both limbs together, which has a better strength development effect than single limb exercises. Maximal strength development uses highly loaded movements, typically 80% of one rep max or higher, to increase force production. Power training develops how quickly, explosively, you can apply your force against resistance. Let's get clear on the difference between power and strength training. Strength training aims to produce maximum force no matter how long it takes. Power aims to develop force as quickly as possible. You use strength to pull your opponent's head off and power to knock them out. Power exercise examples include Olympic lifts, e.g. split jerk, jerk press, clean, clean and jerk, snatch, etc. Jump squats, kettlebell swings, etc. Speed training develops the maximum velocity you can move against little or no resistance. When you fight, you're moving against little to no resistance. In most cases, the only resistance you have is the weight of your gloves. If you're an amateur, you might have to move against little resistance of shin guards and elbow pads. Speed training examples include reaction drills, sprints, plyometrics, medicine ball drills, single kicks, punches, etc. Strength, power, and speed are all important, but start training strength first. Generally, power is more important to a Thai boxer than strength, as we rarely have the luxury of taking as long as we'd like to apply our force. We must strike, throw, and defend as quickly as possible. But this doesn't mean that strength training shouldn't be part of a Thai boxer's training. Strength is a crucial foundation for all athletic qualities. If you want to be faster or more powerful, then you first need to be capable of producing more force, become stronger. It's something I'm always banging on about, and for good reason. And most fighters are still getting it very wrong. From the many questions I get from fighters, the majority still aren't training for strength, although they mistakenly believe they are. Become a three to five person. Here is a simplified, easy to remember structure that helps you to design a strength training session. The combination of numbers used depend on your phase of training, training experience, and so on. But as a rough template, it helps you get started. Three, five sessions per week. Three, five exercises per session. Three, five sets per exercise. Three, five reps per set. Three, five minutes rest between sets. Between three to five strength sessions a week provides enough stimulus to increase strength. Although, I generally recommend two X sessions per week for Thai boxers. As this allows sufficient developmental stimulus without eating significantly into sport-specific skill training, and using between three to five different multi-joint exercises with maximum effort gets results. You should include a lift for the lower body, an upper body push, an upper body pull, and something for the core. Performing between three to five sets of each exercise ensures there's sufficient volume for a strength adaptation. Using a weight that you can only lift a maximum of between three and five times with good form will provide an intensity that loads the central nervous system, CNS, sufficiently to cause an adaptation. You'll get much stronger without putting on body weight, and a greater strength to weight ratio will make you more athletic and provide the foundation needed for speed and explosive power. Resting for a minimum of three minutes between sets of the same exercise allows your CNS to recover enough to work at the intensity required to develop strength in the next set. If you take shorter breaks, although you won't feel tired, your CNS will still be shot and unable to transmit a strong enough signal to lift heavy enough. Your wiring simply can't transmit the spark to your muscles without enough recharge time. I like to superset two non-competing exercises back to back without rest to condense workouts. I still aim for a three min rest period before repeating the same exercise again. Your whole session should take an hour or less. As a rough and ready outline, you could do a lot worse than applying the three to five structure to your strength training sessions. Muay Thai strength? We must consider that strength requirements are relative. For example, a Thai boxer doesn't need the same strength levels as a wrestler. However, without a decent level of relative strength, your ultimate performance will suffer and your risk of injury increases significantly. In fact, local osteopaths and therapists refer a lot of injured clients to me that simply need strengthening to get them out of pain and to move well. It's also possible to be strong without being powerful. There are plenty of bench press monsters that can't snap out a fast, powerful punch. They can push with great force, but at much lower speeds. You can see them coming a mile away. Once you have strength, you must train to apply that force quickly, which is to increase your rate of force development power. And eventually, especially before your next fight, you'll have to train for maximal speed, moving against little or no resistance, as this is exactly what you'll be needing to do in your fight. 
To illustrate how you can combine strength, power, and speed exercises into one session, we'll consider a worked example from a power block of training with fighter Joe Lemaire to help him prepare for a fight. And although power is the emphasis, we also train both speed and strength and maintenance doses too. This is how we train strength, power, and speed in the same session. This block of training is designed to increase Joe's power while concurrently maintaining his speed and strength levels. We're looking at just the lower body exercises from the training session to illustrate how different exercises and loads can hit different velocities and result in a different training effect. Coordinating strength, power, and speed in the same session. 1. Speed, Band Resisted, Broad Jump We began with Band Resisted Broad Jumps, as these are the fastest of the three exercises and require a great deal of fine motor control. If Joe was already pre-fatigued from heavier exercises, then he wouldn't have moved as fast, and we wouldn't have improved his speed specifically. The Broad Jump was selected because it's a high-velocity, lower-body exercise with a significant horizontal component. Effectively producing a lot of horizontal force translates specifically to Muay Thai striking techniques, where you direct your force toward your opponent. The band-resisted version of this exercise was used to minimize the shock loading on the knees and the patella tendon in particular, allowing Joe to fully commit to jump without risking knee damage. 2. Power, Hang Hit and High Pull the hang hit and high pull exercise is the main focus of the training session in this block as it maximizes power production. This exercise is a precursor to Olympic lifting exercises like the clean and the snatch and allows Joe to build the explosive technique required to do a better job of these Olympic lifts when we return to them very soon. It develops power without the full technical demand of the clean or snatch lifts. Again, there's a strong hip dominant action which develops horizontal power toward an opponent. The load used was selected so that Joe could move it at a vertical velocity between 1.0 and 1.3 M per S, ideal for increasing power without messing up his technical form using his heaviest loads. The exercise volume load spent on this exercise predominates the lower body training in this session and suits our objective of power development in this training block. Three, strength front squat. The front squat is there to maintain strength levels in this block of training. It's the slowest, heaviest lift in this particular session and demands the least neuromuscular motor control and skill. It's therefore best placed later in the session to avoid undue fatigue, which would slow the velocity of the faster, more powerful exercises in the training block. I've opted for a knee dominant strength lift here as the other two lower body exercises in this session have been deliberately hip dominant and this pattern will be a little more fatigued. This will allow Joe to go a bit heavier in these front squats than he would otherwise. Programming proper S and C, how to make the most progress in the least amount of time. Thai boxers, like most athletes, don't have much time to dedicate to weight training sessions. It's therefore critical to train specifically in the gym, be the most productive you can, then get out and get on with other important things. Fighters must focus on strength, power, and speed development in the weights room, as these adaptations aren't maximally stressed during Thai boxing training and will otherwise leave untapped physical potential. Most fighters can only afford a couple of resistance training sessions per week in the gym, and that's plenty if you're doing the training correctly. Train the entire body in each gym session, rather than isolating muscle groups, bodybuilder style. In this way, your whole body gets a training stimulus two, three times a week, rather than just once with a split muscle group routine. More stimulus simply means much more progress. Get at least two total body sessions in your program every week on non-consecutive days. So make sure you don't do two days in a row. You can go to three sessions in a week at a stretch, but most fighters struggle to fit that in around all the other cardio conditioning and Muay Thai training and recovery can be tricky. Don't perform whole body weight training sessions on consecutive days. You'll be under recovered and the stimulus won't result in efficient adaptation. You can train other energy systems without any problem, but give your CNS, central nervous system, a rest. Get enough rest. We must remember that training is the stimulus, but it's during the recovery from this stimulus that the adaptation happens. When you get fitter, stronger, more powerful, faster, prioritize recovery and adaptation over stimulus, and be sure not to compromise recovery. 